We're going to come to the time in our service now where we will look at a passage of Scripture and talk about what it means for our lives, why it matters today. So if you have a Bible with you, or if you want to use the Pew Bible in front of you, if you turn to Exodus chapter 7 in this brown Pew Bible, that'll be on page 44. Exodus chapter 7. We're going to start just a few verses before. When you found that, would you stand with me and we'll read together from God's Word. Starting at chapter 6, verse 28. Now when the Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, Since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, And the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. This is God's word. may be seated. may pray for us now and commit what we say now to God. Living God, we come before your word now with open hearts. I pray that they would be open. We long to hear from you from this book that we believe you inspired to be written. Because we believe you inspired it, we believe you speak to us through it today. It is not just a book of of history, but a living book that speaks to us now. And so I ask God that you would accomplish the purpose that you have in each one of us this morning. Speak to us by your Spirit and bring encouragement where we need encouragement, challenge where we need challenge. And may we be submissive to this Word as those who sit under your Word and not those who sit over it. And as I always ask, eternal God, move and govern my tongue now to speak your truth. Amen. Well, we're continuing this morning in this series we've been going through in the first 15 chapters of the book of Exodus that we've entitled the gospel according to Moses. And as we said, the the whole reason for that title is because as we look through this story of a people freed from slavery through the agency of a Savior sent to free them, it really is, in a sense, a, a sort of epic telling of the one story of the gospel, of what God has done for us in Jesus and freeing us from our slavery to sin and death by His death on the cross. And if you haven't been with us Uh, through these weeks that we've been going through this series, uh, we've covered a lot already. Uh, We've looked at everything from God's sending of His people into Egypt and then the resulting enslavement there to to God's calling of Moses and His revelation of His divine name, Yahweh, to now the first uh, turning of the wheels, you could say, of God's rescue plan to free His people from slavery. And as is sometimes the case, we've also seen that now things have begun to get actually dramatically worse before they get better for God's people. Uh, Over the last two weeks, Kyle and Michael have talked about how when Moses and Aaron first came to Pharaoh with this request to let them go out into the wilderness for three days to sacrifice to God there, that that request actually had a terrible effect. It, It brought about increasing 
pressure, increasing, intensifying abuse from Pharaoh because of their request, as though Pharaoh wanted to snuff out any hope, any spark of hope in these people. But now, today is where we begin to see the tables start to turn. The skies have been increasingly dark now for God's people for over 400 years. Now, we're going to see the storm clouds are beginning to form on the horizon for the Egyptians. For God sends Moses and Aaron now to speak to Pharaoh once again, but this time God sends them not with a request for a three-day leave of absence, but with a command to let the people of Israel go for good. As you could probably imagine, uh, Moses and Aaron do this with a great deal of fear and trembling. They know what they're coming to ask. If you need a visual to to help you understand this situation, it's much like if you would imagine Dorothy and her timid friends coming before the great and powerful Oz with their requests for a heart, courage, and a brain. Now sure, in that story, Dorothy, you know, she's got her powerful sparkly red pumps on and she can come in with that, but she doesn't even know necessarily how powerful they are. In Exodus, at least, Moses and Aaron, they know that the shepherd's staff they bring with them does have power, but I think even they probably come in with not a great deal more confidence than Dorothy had as they come before the great king of Egypt asking him now to let his entire slave labor force go. An unbelievable request, really. So this is now an epic turning point in the story of Exodus. And, and, and the story itself ha- has been saying so much to us, and I think today it's going to be no different because I think what we're going to look at now has incredible significance for us today is so important to look at because here's the thing as children of God today you and I are also at many different times and places we're also going to be asked to speak for God God has called each one of us to speak for him this to deliver his message of deliverance to people and just like Moses many of us are going to be terrified in doing that it's that awful word many of us don't like to say evangelism we don't like hearing that, and we, we many times have this fear of, of inadequacy. We feel unprepared. And my hope for us is that in looking at how God leads Moses and Aaron through a, a situation that is likely many times more terrifying and perilous than anything that we're going to face, that in doing that, we'll be able to learn ourselves what that looks like, what obedience to God looks like in that situation, to prepare us ahead of time when God calls you and I to speak for him to the people in our lives today. All right, so how we're going to do that is we're going to just look at our passage this morning in just two ways. I want to show you this morning God's superior goal in our obedience and then God's superior power in our transformation. Just those two things. God's superior goal in our obedience and God's superior power in our transformation. So, If you closed your Bibles, I ask you to open them up again to Exodus 7. I want you to follow along with me and see what this looks like. Okay, so let's start by looking at God's superior goal in our obedience. God's superior goal in our obedience. Now, as we just uh, looked at here, our passage, I think, actually begins a little bit above chapter 7 and verse 28. Look there again with me. There we read that, The Lord spoke to Moses in Egypt. He said, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, everything I tell you. But Moses said to the Lord, since I speak with faltering lips, why would Pharaoh listen to me? Now, what Moses is doing as he writes the book of Exodus here is really just he's helping the reader to track, to continue to track with the story. Because as we saw last week, Moses takes a 14-verse excursus, a, a detour to Help us understand the family heritage of him and Moses. So, really all Moses is doing is recapping. He's jumping back into the story from where he left off in verse 10. If you want to jump back there, just if you're using the P Bible, it's just the paragraph over. Look at verse 10. There arose his moat, wrote, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? since I speak with faltering lips. So he's he's trying to signal to us now in these next verses, I'm I'm picking up the story from where I left off there. That's all he's trying to do here. So here, 
Just like in, in verse 28 through 30 that we read, I think what we see right out of the gate is that Moses, he's got a very misguided idea, a confused idea about what the ultimate goal of obedience to God actually is. Now, why do I say that? Well, if we look at verses 11 and then 29 of chapter 6, God has given Moses very clear instructions. He is to go to Pharaoh and deliver God's command to let his people go. And yet in both tellings, Moses highlights the fact that at least at this point in time, he understands obedience to God as being about him and his abilities and not about God. And I think that's why you just continue to see this repeated pushback from Moses. He doesn't understand yet. Now, to be fair to Moses, I mean, there is a sense in which our obedience, a part of what, why we obey is to grow in godliness, is to grow in our trust in God. That's, that's absolutely a part of why we obey. The problem is that's not exactly what Moses is getting at here. Because you see, okay, well, at the end of the day, Moses, Moses is a pragmatist. He is an ultimate pragmatist. And I can actually identify a great deal with Moses here. I don't know if, if you're like that at all, too. Uh, uh, you see... This is an area that I would say God is still continuing to work on me a great deal in um, because I'm often certain in my own life that God has given me the spiritual gift of being able to look at a situation, hear an idea from you, and immediately be able to tell you why it won't work and what the problems are with it. I, I can easily do that for you. As you can probably imagine that's, that's not a gift uh, my wife regularly gives thanks for or, or would probably even refer to with the term gift. But isn't that exactly what Moses is doing here as well? And God is giving him this clear direction. Go to Pharaoh and give him this command to let the people go. And, and Moses is just like, hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I love the idea, God, I love it. But you know what you, know what you didn't think about first? He's just talking to God now. You know what you didn't think about? First of all, you still haven't turned me into that Hebrew William Wallace, and that's why... The people of Israel won't follow me. And if the people of Israel won't listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me? God, God, do you see the problems with what you're calling me to do here? And what Moses still fails to see is that the point of why God calls us to do something, when, when he calls us to do something, in this case to speak for him, the only thing that he requires of us is our trust and our obedience. That's it. The results of our obedience, God takes entirely upon himself. But the reason I'm saying Moses thinks obedience is about him is because Moses thinks he can't be obedient to God because he can't produce the results that he thinks God wants. He says, I, I can't do what you're asking because I don't have the strength to make that happen. I mean, you see the emphasis there, it's on, all on Moses and not on God at all. So... <laughs> Once again, as we keep seeing, God continues to, to help along his fearful child. In the first verses here of chapter 7, <coughs> God is continuing to try to help him by, by spelling out the plan for him again, showing him how everything's going to work out. Look at verse uh, 1 and 2 of our passage here. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. Now, in saying that Moses will be like God to Pharaoh, all that's intended here is that Moses wants to highlight the, the relationship between God and prophets, what, what that looks like in an everyday sense. You see uh, how God says Moses' brother Aaron will be his prophet? This is because Moses, he'll be telling Aaron exactly what to say, and then Aaron will give that exact message to Pharaoh, just in the same way that God in the scriptures would give his message to prophets and then they would deliver that exact message to whoever he'd sent them to. So this is why God is saying that Pharaoh, Moses will be like God to Pharaoh and, Mo, and Aaron will be his prophet as he delivers Moses' words to Pharaoh. But look at what God says now in the next verses, three through five. Look with me here. God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt with mighty acts of judgment. I will bring up my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord 
when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring Israel out of it. So I think God's communicating two things here now to Moses. First of all, God's superior goal in Moses' obedience is not that Moses would get Pharaoh's attention or that Pharaoh would listen to him. It's that God would get Pharaoh's attention and that Pharaoh would listen to him. God is saying, I'm the one in control here, Moses. And, and in this case, actually, the intended result of your obedience is that Pharaoh won't listen to you or do what you say. That's, that's, my, that's what I want to happen. In fact, I'm going to make sure it happens by hardening Pharaoh's heart so he won't respond to you. And the reason God does that, and I think the second thing we see here, is that God's superior goal for Moses' obedience, which he says in verse 5, is that the people of Egypt will know that I am the Lord. That they will know that I am the Lord. So once again, you, you see here that God's saying the results of your obedience are completely on me. Moses, they have nothing to do with you or your feelings of inadequacy. I'm taking all the results on me. I'm just calling you to obey. Theologian uh, John Durham says in his commentary on this passage, the Lord, Yahweh, is concerned to bring Pharaoh into an experiential knowledge of his powerful presence, not of Moses' truthfulness or, or Aaron's eloquence. He wants to bring Pharaoh into an experiential knowledge of his powerful presence. So in the end, God's patient reply to Moses' assessment of his plan is to tell him, actually, Moses, you're right. You're right. Pharaoh is he's not going to listen to you. And actually, it's probably going to look to you like my plan's not working out. But what you don't know is that that's actually exactly what I want to happen. That's what I want to happen. So I want to tell you now so that you don't worry about it when it feels like my plan's not working out. I'm trying to tell you ahead of time, okay? But all that you need to do, all I'm calling you to do, is just obey what I've called you to do. Seen those things on Facebook that you had one job, uh, memes and stuff, where people have just done these colossal failures with just one simple job? This is what God's saying. You've got one job. Just obey what I've called you to do. And how often, how often do we need to hear that exact same message in our own lives. I know I do. How often does God, we feel God's prompting, let's say, to, to share the message of the gospel with someone, and, and immediately we got 15 different reasons for God why that's not going to work. Oh, no, no, God, you, don't, you actually don't know this person, they've got this, or, or I can't, I don't. We do that all the time. Or how often does God uh, call us to make ourselves known as Christians in front of people? to willingly carry out that identification piece that we've talked about so that people can begin to connect our behavior with our belief in God. And, and we, God calls us to that, and we just hand him back a big list of all the things that we're sure he didn't think about before he called us to do that. How often do we foolishly and arrogantly forget that God is simply looking for our obedience? He's not looking for our feedback. He's looking for our trust that he knows what he's doing. He's got it covered. He's not looking for our assessment of his strategy. And as we move towards a deeper push to be living out these, these core values as a church, particularly this idea of everyone is a minister, my hope is that we'll all begin to see as a church that very simply, if you're married here today, if, if you're married or you're in a significant relationship Guess what? As God's child, God has called you to declare and demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel to your spouse, to your girlfriend or boyfriend. If you have kids, God has called you. You are called to declare and demonstrate the transforming power of the gospel to your kids. If you work with people, I'm guessing you do. If you go to school with people, God's called you to those people, to speak for him to them. If you live around people, you live in Vancouver, you do. God has called you to be ministers to those people, to speak for him to those people. He has. But you see the freeing message of this passage already. God has said, your, your obedience is all that you got to do. The results are completely up to him. He's taken that off the plate for you. You don't have to transform anybody. It's not, that's not your job. Your job is just to be obedient to what he's called you to do. It's incredibly freeing when we think of it that way. 
And that the heart, one of the really hard parts about what we just read is that just because the results of our obedience to speak for God don't look like what we hoped for or thought they would look like does not mean that they are not God's intended results. We need to see that very clearly. Just because the results don't look like what we thought they should does not mean they are not God's intended results. And it's an incredibly difficult truth to hear, but what this passage is also, we're clearly seeing here, if nothing else, is that even the rejection of God's message is also under His sovereign control. Even the rejection of it is. And isn't that what we're seeing here with Pharaoh? I mean, we said, I said a few weeks ago, we're going to keep coming into this again and again and again as we go through this passage. We've got to do something with it. We can't just pretend it's not there or just hurry by and hope it's going to go away. We've got to deal with what God is saying here with this hardening of Pharaoh's heart stuff. And what I think we're clearly seeing here in our passage is that while a part of our obedience a part of God's goal in that is our, our growth in godliness, is our growth in our trust of Him. God's superior goal in our obedience is that people might glorify Him. That's God's superior goal in our obedience, that they might glorify Him and that the world might know that He is the Lord. That's God's superior goal in our obedience. And He does that both by demonstrating His grace as well as his justice. And I don't know how that hits you, but I find it almost impossible to swallow. Almost impossible. Because I, I understand the theology behind God's sovereignty and salvation, and I believe it. But while I, I rejoice in God's unmerited grace in saving me, my heart still aches when I think about people in my life that I care deeply about who've heard the truth of the gospel and are right now they're rejecting it. And it terrifies me because I know that the results of my sharing the gospel with those people is not up to me. I don't get to decide. And so maybe like many of you, I, I, I take that truth as a separate calling from God just to, to pray all the harder for those people pray all the harder that God might open their eyes and their hearts to receive the truth of what he's done for them. In fact, could we just, could we do that for like 30 seconds right now? I know there's people in your life that you already have been praying for. Let's take 30 seconds right now. That person or those people in your life who know the truth and are currently rejecting it, can we just pray right now for God to open their hearts? Let's do that for a moment. All that we are called to is obedience to God's commands. That's it. And we see that. Actually, that's Moses and Aaron lived that out in their own lives. We see uh, verse 6 and 10. We read Moses and Aaron did exactly as the Lord commanded them. But we need this clearly in our minds or we're just going to continue to get confused like Moses did. If obedience to God is about us, we're going to continue to try to produce the results of our obedience ourselves. But if obedience to God is about God, then we'll leave the results of our obedience to Him and just worry about being obedient. That's how you know, actually, the motivation behind your obedience. If you share the gospel, if you are willing to step out and share the hope of the gospel with someone and they don't respond, it doesn't mean you didn't obey right. But even in saying that, actually, I'll tell you what, in our own lives, when we are obedient... And we see it even in our passage here. When we are obedient to what God commands us to, especially in difficult circumstances of life, 
And that has an incredibly powerful effect on people who witness it. An incredibly powerful effect. Which is actually going to lead us to the, the second thing that I want us to look at from our passage. I want us to look now at God's superior power in our transformation. God's superior power in our transformation. So just like we read Moses and Aaron, they, they are obedient to God. They go to deliver his message to Pharaoh. And we see really just the continued care of God for Moses and Aaron as they step out in obedience to him. Because honestly, God, God knows already, and I bet Moses and Aaron have a pretty good idea that Pharaoh, he's not exactly going to be happy to see these Hebrew shepherds again so quickly, right? He's not going to be excited about that when he asks his assistant, okay, what do we got next? And he's like, hmm, oh, looks like we've got a Moses and an Aaron back to see you. I mean, he's not going to be happy about that at all. Because Pharaoh clearly already thinks these guys are a joke, and they've wasted his time. They've just excited his anger, and now they're coming back. So now, if he sees them at all, he's going to want to test them as to whether or not anything of their saying about this Hebrew God being with them, he's going to want to test to see if that's true. And I'll tell you, if this test doesn't, doesn't work out, it's going to go very bad for Moses and Aaron, very quickly. So look how God prepares Moses and his brother in verse 9. God says, When Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. Now do you see the, the foreknowledge of God in that preparation? He's not strategizing with them like, okay, if he does this, then you do that. He, he says, when. When Pharaoh says that, this is what you do. I, I find that incredibly helpful. I wish God would do that <laughs> for me sometimes. We see in verse 10, and then they, they do it. They, they get entrance before Pharaoh. They throw the staff down. It becomes a snake. And, and actually, it's interesting. Some of the things I saw this week in study is that the snake that their staff turns into, that's actually a different word now in this passage than the previous uh, times when Moses throws the staff down out in the wilderness and then before the people of Israel. It still turns into a snake, but it actually, the word now in Hebrew means monstrous snake, huge snake. Some interpreters even interpret this word meaning dragon, crocodile. It's something different, intimidating, powerful. So whatever it is, it changes, and, and I'm sure Moses and Aaron are probably breathing just a little bit easier, okay, now that God has come through for them, he's, he's validated their status before Pharaoh as much more than just Hebrew shepherds. I mean, can you imagine how lame that would be if they had said, this is the God's power, and they threw down the staff, and it just kind of clanked on the ground and sat there? <laughs> I mean, Pharaoh would be like, okay, was that it? Was that it? Did I miss it? Hugely embarrassing, but God comes through, the staff does change into this monstrous snake, but although Pharaoh is impressed, and he must be because Moses and Aaron are still alive, we see already the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, just like God said, because instead of submitting himself to the power of this, this, this clearly demonstrated power of this Hebrew God, instead he calls his own team of, of magicians and sorcerers to try to recreate, to try to duplicate this miracle that Aaron's just performed. And what's really unbelievable is they do it. They do it. Look at verse 11. Pharaoh then summoned the wise men and sorcerers and Egyptians, mag Egyptian magicians, also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff and it became a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Now, that's a really crazy plot twist, isn't it? I mean, Moses and Aaron are probably thinking, uh, God, <laughs> why would you give them the same snake staffs as us? This is really awkward right now. I mean, it would almost seem, if just reading this, that these magicians and sorcerers had the same power as God to do the same miracles. How, how is that even possible? Well, a few things just to, to note. First of all, although the sorcerers are able to recreate the sign, we see, first of all, almost immediately, 
the superior power of God's transformation, and that Aaron's staff swallows up all the other snakes. So already we see superior power. I mean, commentators on this passage have said, the narrative of, the narrative of Exodus, quote, does not seek to provide any further explanation to the means by which the magicians perform these signs, but in each case, the description focuses instead on the events that indicate that although the magicians could wield power and bring about this sign, they did not have mastery or authority over it. Here this is shown by the fact that Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, end quote. Second thing to say is that God did say before Moses and Aaron ever went in that he was going to harden Pharaoh's heart, right? He told them ahead of time, but he never said once how he was going to do that. So I find it completely logical actually to say that actually God is the one. God is the one who gave those sorcerers power to transform their staffs into the snakes. Because in that way, it, it validates Moses and Aaron as being more than just hacks. But Pharaoh's heart remains hard because he sees that his own magician, who he also sees as powerful, can match Moses and Aaron's power as well. And if you look at verse 13, that's exactly what we see as the result. Look with me there. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. So what do we do with that? I mean, I don't know, if, you, if you're like me at all, maybe you, you're reading this, and we're like, okay, well, that's, that's crazy. Wow. I mean, it, it actually sort of seemed like it worked out in the end for Moses and Aaron. That's That's great. And even if this whole series on Exodus, maybe we're just saying, well, yeah, sure, I get it. God's called Moses, given him this staff. That's awesome. But now here you're, you're saying God's called me to speak to my family and coworkers and neighbors. You're telling me that God's called me now to do the same thing? I have a calling like that too? Okay, great. Well, awesome. I, I, sorry, I, I, I hadn't received any special snake staff. I, I don't have any cool... Jedi lightsaber to wow people. How has God empowered me with any superior transforming power? How has he done that? And the answer is, with your life. With your life. Because think about it. What, what was Moses' staff but the sign of God's presence and power with Moses as he went out in obedience to God's command? In the same way, I promise you, one of the most powerful demonstrations of God's transforming power that He equips each of us with today who are His, his children is with your personal testimony. The story of how God saved you. The staff, if you want to call it, that we toss down on the ground is the story of who we were before we knew Jesus. And the snake that we pick up again is now the story of a transformed life that He's recreated in us. And a transformed life is absolutely evidence of the transforming power of God, of that, that new creation that he's made us to be that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. A transformed life. And that's a, that's a superior demonstration of God's transforming power, and it is in two ways. First of all, in one sense, we now get to become like the, the man born blind that we talk about in, in John, we read about in John 9. This guy had been born blind, and Jesus healed him. All of a sudden, the Pharisees are like, who's this Jesus? What, what do you mean he healed you? And the guy just says, I don't know. I don't know who he is. All I know is I used to be blind, and now I can see. Simple testimony of transformation. The evidence of God's transforma, transforming power in our testimony is just being able to say, this is who I used to be before God saved me. Look who he's made me to be now. In saying that, of course, we need to ask the question, does my life actually demonstrate transformation has taken place? I think that's an important question to ask, absolutely, because if, if we're not seeing transforming power, it starts to look pretty weak if we're saying, God can transform you, but you don't see anything different in your life. But I'll tell you what, a life that is truly being transformed by Jesus is a powerful, validating sign of God's transforming power to people. Second thing to say is that on the other hand, this is what I was mentioning before, 
when we demonstrate the reality of our transformed lives before people, it's definitely a superior apologetic of, of our hope in the gospel than any other uh, uh, self-help, therapeutic, uh, uh, CrossFit, Oprah Winfrey sort of models of transformation that the world has to offer. God's transforming power easily swallows up those, those imitations of transformation. So when you're letting people into your life and then they see you go through something hard and, and still remain obedient to what you say you believe, man, that does something to people. When they put themselves in your shoes and can't imagine being able to respond like you have, man, that, that begins to bring about life altering questions that's where they start happening in people's minds and your consistent although sometimes incredibly difficult obedience to God actually particularly in the difficult stuff of life rather than hardening always at times will be the fuel for some amazing transforming in people's thinking it just messes with the mind to understand how for instance when they see you facing suffering with hope that they can't imagine having themselves does something to people. When they see you facing injustice and then offering the same forgiveness that was given to you in Jesus, that does something to people. When they see you operating by different values than they have, when their own values, although dishonest, could have actually brought you greater gain and you continue to be obedient to what you've said you believe? People take notice when that happens. And lives are transformed and people are discipled when we do that. The shepherd's staff that God has given to each one of us who are his is a transformed life. And the calling that he gives to each of us is to just go to everyone that he places in our path, go and be willing to speak for him. All those people who we even just prayed for just right now, who, who are still looking inside themselves, who are looking around them to things and stuff in order to find the power to change and still come up empty, still come up feeling disappointed. A transformed life is an amazing demonstration to them of God's transforming power. When you step back and look at our passage from a bit of a higher elevation, I think there's one more thing we see as it relates to God's calling on each of us to declare and demonstrate the gospel to people that he's placed in our lives, and it's this. When you look through this, this narrative that we've covered this morning, or actually anything that we've seen up until now in these first seven chapters, have you seen one time when God uh, canceled, uh, rescinded, took back his call on Moses because of Moses continued protesting and complaining that he wasn't ready, that he wasn't adequate? Do you see one time that God did that? Was there one time when, when God said, okay, Moses, I get it, all right? You know what? The people of Israel can wait. We're going to put you in a 10-month training, leadership training program and speech therapy, and then I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. Did, did God do that? No. God's command over and over to Moses is just go. Don't go get changed. Go right now as you are, and I will be with you, and, and I will give you signs of my power to transform as you go, but I'm telling you to go now just like you are, just with all the knowledge and ability you have right now. I'm telling you now to go. Because in our own lives, how often do we protest with the exact same words that Moses had when God calls us to speak for him to people in our lives today? I know I have it many times. At times I still do. When God puts an opportunity to speak for him right in front of my face, and, and I literally just, I'm like, no. No, God, I, I can't. I don't know, I don't know enough. I, I'm not ready. You can't just throw this at me. I'm not an evangelist. I, 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 what, I'm just going to say something dumb if I try to talk to them. And we step back from what God's called us to do. We let the opportunity pass. You ever been there before? I loved something that we just heard recently. Uh, a pastor from San Francisco, Francis Chan, say a few weeks ago at the Multiply Conference. 
that some of us uh, went to at West Side there. And as it relates to our fear-based refusal to be obedient to God's call to speak for Him, listen to what he said. He said, so many people are sitting in our churches today waiting until they're ready. Waiting until they know enough to speak for God. And I love this. You know what he said? He said, if, if that's what you're waiting for, a time when you're ready, when you know enough, that is the worst time to go. That's the worst time to go. Because then you're coming in with your own self-confidence and trusting in your own ability to bring about the results. It's the worst time to go. God isn't calling you to know enough Bible trivia facts or, or, or to be a good enough speaker before you obey Him. He's just calling you to obey. Remember, the, re the results are completely up to Him. Completely up to Him. Will you today be obedient to just go to that spouse, those kids, the, those neighbors and coworkers? Will you just go and be obedient and leave the results to Him? Maybe you're still not convinced. Let, let me say something that maybe will help some of you. Uh, uh, if you were to ask me, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer every question that you would ask me about this book. What about the, I, I'm, I may not even know the answer. There's many times when I'm talking to people throughout the day, just regular conversation, that hours later, lying in bed, I think about what I should have said to them. I don't know what you think about my ability to speak, but I'll tell you what, if you had 15 hours to, to research and plan what you were going to say ahead of time, you'd probably sound more well-spoken too. I guarantee you, any one of the leaders in this church, any other church, anyone you think is great evangelist would say the same thing to you. Don't get fooled. Don't, don't fool yourself into believing that, that, that speaking for God is about being ready. It isn't. Speaking for God is not about being ready. It's about being willing. That's it. And sure, should, should we always be learning and trying to grow in our ability and knowledge? Yes. But if you're waiting to be ready to speak for God, ready to know enough for your life to be perfect enough, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. So let me ask you, has God transformed you? Has God changed you from someone maybe that hated Jesus or was just completely indifferent to him to someone that loves him and worships him? Has he done that in your life? Are, are you willing now to, to live out that increasingly transformed life in front of other people with the hope that he'll transform them too? Are you willing to do that? Then look at me. You're ready now. You're ready.